دعبد مريو آلوه شمايو ورعو قول هون إيلون الحق لو عداكي له واو برعو وخولي عثبت حق لو عداكي له إيعو ما يطولد له أحيت مريو آلوه مترو على في أرعو ودوم ليت المفلاح برعو ما بوعو ثوليقو ما نرعو ومشقيو الخولة في أرعو وقبال مريو آلوه لو دوم عفرو من أودمتو وانفاح بافاو نشم ثود حاي وهو أودوم النفش حايو وانصاب مريو آلو فرديثو بعدين من قديم وثوم تامون لو دوم دغبال ووعي مريو آلوه على رعو كل إيلون درغيغ المحذو وشافير الميخال ويلونو دحاي بمصعفات فرديثو ويلونو دي دعتو الطبثو ودبشتو ونهرو نفاقو نفقو من عدين المشقو يوثيل فرديثو ومن تامون فوريش وهو لربعو رحشين وهو بربعو ريشيون شميد حاد في شون هود حودار الخولو أرعو دحويلو التامون دهبو ودهبو درعو هوي طوب وتامون كيف دبيرولي وشميد نهرو تانينو جيحون هود حودار الخولو أرعو دكوش وشميد نهرو دتلوثو دقلاث هودو زيل لقبال أثور ونهرو دربعو هو فروث ودبار مريو أروه لودوم وشبقيب فرديثو دعدين نفلحيو ونطريو وفقا وفقيد مريو أروه لودوم ومرلي من كل هون إيلون دب فرديثو المخال تيخول من إيلونو دي دعثو الطبثو ودبشتو لو تيخول ماني ما يطول دب يومو تيخول ماني موتو تموت ومار مريو أروه لو شافير النهوي أودوم بالحوداو عباد لي معدرونو أخوثي وغبال مريو آلوه من أرعو كولو حايوثو الدبرو وكولو فرحتو دشمايو ويتي إنو الوث أودوم دنحسي مونو قوري الهون وكول دقرو الهون أودوم نفشو حيثو هاو هو شمي وقرو أودوم شموهي الخولو بعيرو والخولو فرحتو دشمايو والخولو حايوثو الدبرو ولو دوم لو إشكاح لي معدرونو أخوثي ورمي مريو آلوه شليو على دوم ودميخ وانساب حدو من العاو ووحيد بسروح لو فيه وتاقين مريو آلوه العود انساب من أودوم لتثو ويتيه لو دوم ومار أودوم هو خانو هونو زبنو قرمو من قرماي وبسرو من بسر هودي تتقري أتثو ما تولد من قبرو نسيبو ما تول هونو نشبوك قبرو لا بوي ولا ما ونقاف لتسي ونهون تريهون حاد بسار وهوا وتريهون عرطي لويين ودوم وتسي ولو بهتي قريونو تريونو من اوينجليون قاديشو مريو حانون شليحو بريشيث إثاو ملثو وهو ملثو إثاو الوفالوه والوه إثاو هو ملثو هنو إثاو بريشيث الوث آلوه كول بيده و وبالعوداو أفلوح ذوه وث ميدام دهو بحايه و وحايه إثيهون نهرو دبني نوشو وهو نهرو بحيشوخو منهار وحيشوخو لو أدرخي وهو هو هو برنوشو دشتادار من آلوه شمي يوحانون هنو إثو لسهدوثو دنسهيد عال نهرو تخول نوشن هيمين بيده لو هو هو نهرو إلو دنسهيد عال نهرو إيثو غير نهرو دشرورو منهار الخول نوش دوث العلمو بعلمو هو وعلمو بيده هو وعلمو لو يدعي لديلي إيثو وديلي لو قبلوي أيلين دين تقبلوي يابل هون شلطونو دبنايو ضالو هون هون ليلين دم هيمنين بشمي أيلين دلاو من دمو ولو من صبيونو دبسرو ولو من صبيونو دغبرو إلو من الله إيثيلاد وميلثو بسرو هو واقين بان وحزين شبحي شبحو أخذي حيدو يد منابو دملي طيبوثو قشتو يوحانون سهد على وقعو ويمار هونا وهاو دمريث بوثار أوثي وهو ليقدو ماي ميتول دقدو ماي يومين
So now I'm going to ask you to do something which you're permitted to do imperfectly. Can we just get everyone to move a bit towards the center so the people on the end just move in a bit so that we just, because again, when you're speaking up here, it's nice to sort of, you don't have to sit next to somebody if you don't want to, but just a little closer, okay? And I'm conscious that in our last session, we actually got going pretty well. So out of respect for the speakers, not a lack of respect, I'm going to revert back to not giving an introduction. Okay, because I want to get into the conversation. So it's not a lack of respect. It's only to say we actually want to hear more of you. So Bartolini Tovu is from the Cameroon. That's the introduction. But you're a humanist, you're an artist, you're a thinker, and you want to share your thoughts about what the future is about. So please come up and join us. Good evening, or good, good morning. <laughs> Excuse me. I think I am still, I am still sleeping. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to tell you that uh, I speak broken English, broken Dutch, and Alice is broken. I'm going to try <laughs> to miss those two languages <laughs> and I think because before I was thinking that French is universal language but it's not <laughs> so I, I, I just discovered that but happy to be here and I would like to tell you something just from my experience because uh, I am visual artist and when I was young, my dream was to go in a fine art, school of fine art. It was my dream after uh, grammar school. And then I stayed, I, I started in, in Abidjan after Grenoble and the last time, the last station was in Dusseldorf. After that, I was thinking that it was good to start my career. And then I start by gallery, by, I start to show my work in gallery, and then I receive a lot of money from my artwork. And one day I say, I need to give back something to my community. I need to give back something to Africa, because this continent was built by Africa, not by Europe. They have, this, they have another problem. And then I have knowledge in art world. I need to give back that to, to Africa, not to Cameroon, to Africa. And this wish still to, to be my dream, to invite all the African people that they have knowledge in agriculture, in sport, in ecology, in education to come back and give back something to, to Africa. That is a word that Gilbert and George call the giving person, to be generous, to give back something to your community. And then I built Banjun Station by my own money. I never have a grant for that. And it is uh, art center, as you see, but a, a museum of contemporary art and the collection come from exchange that I start to do since 20 years with my artist friend, a friend of mine. And I would like to thank here David Lynch because he gave 30 lithographs to, Banjo, to help Banjo Station. And I, I thank all the list of the artists that they trust of this project. And from, from this land, I receive a land from my family. And 
the, the, the land was no, no house there. I built this building, two buildings, from 2004 to 2008, four years. I lost my back in this building up. Four years, day by day, I was there. And I was in, in Barcelona. I was fascinated by Gaudi, uh, Gaudi artwork, but that was very good for Banjul Station because we are living on the equator. There is a lot of raining and the wall of the museum can have water infiltration and with mosaic was a good way to, 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 to I don't know how to say of English, impermeabilize, to, to, to don't have infiltration water inside the museum. It was a good idea to use mosaic and you're going to discover slowly, by slowly, slowly, what, how I decide to create this more museum, but and to and not make a copy of a museum in Europe. The, the first thing was how to bring people inside the museum because to have some, this kind of building in a village in a in, 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 how you call that, in a yeah, small village. Banjun is 100,000 people, but it's my village, I can say. How to bring people inside the museum was to, 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 to use some practice of the culture, culture of the community and to bring that inside the museum and then the people going to discover what is inside. And the people like, like, um, like funerai there. And then I decide, I give the space for the people to make the funerai in the museum near Louis Bourgeois, near Miro, uh, near all the artists of the collection that I have, I receive from galleries and collector. Um, and then I decide to make a wedding inside the museum and decide to make a, a big party after harvest because the second part of Banjo Station is to make is agricultural project. Why agricultural project? Because the first thing was to give the food to people and this food, it, we decide to make organic agriculture and to give a good food to people and to make a party during the harvest, bring people inside the museum to eat, to make funerai, to make a wedding, to make a birthday. And, the, and during those all invitation, the people slowly, slowly take part for, yeah, for the museum. And we have artists, residents, and Banjul Station, it is not a ghetto museum, not just for African artists. No, I don't like that. I am against ghetto. Banjul Station, the people come from, from all over the world, and they st they, we have 12 studios there, like uh, Villa Medicis. And the, the young artists make performance, and and workshop. Library. We're still waiting the books for our library.
the, the most important thing was to make a workshop with, with teenagers. When I was young, I, I, we never had the chance to go to museum. Now I build this museum. I, I try to bring the teenager inside the museum, but sometimes it's difficult because the parents uh, don't understand the way that we want to develop. Sometimes some people, some parents are against because they are thinking that we, we, we are in we are, we are, that Banjo station. It's a magical place. They don't understand because we have a lot of drawing outside. They have a free with, with the drawing sometimes, or, or they don't understand what is art, that we have this difficulty there, how to bring people inside the museum. But sometimes we, 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 we can have some, some student. And the most important thing, again, is to live in community, to, to be all time together. We have two or three long tables. It's important to have some sofa and table in an, 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 an art center to create a space for discussion. And when I opened this museum, I decided at the same time to create a festival of music to give for young people the first chance to, to sing on a stage. And it was, that is the first festival, Gold Star for slam and rap. And that is the same way how to bring the young people in, in the museum and it's work because the community and many people are present during Gold Star Festival. Performance, and yeah, that is the second part of Banjun Station. Agricultural project is behind Banjun, St Banjun Station to be different than a classic museum in Europe. I'm not sure that uh, Tate Modern going to have <laughs> banana plantation <laughs> in three months <laughs> behind the Tate Modern. <laughs> and, yeah, and at the same time, I work with the teenager, with, with, with them. I I am inside the group with, with them, and I create some small studio in the plantation to continue artist residence in the plantation. And the, the, the big plantation that we have is coffee, but at the same time, in coffee plantation, we have corn and banana, something to eat before Harvest coffee. <laughs> to combine agriculture and coffee was very important for me because we developed this coffee until the package. And here in, in Mobile Cafeteria, the first exhibition was in north of Denmark, Arus Museum, and I test the first Banjun Station coffee uh, to people. And we package ourselves, our Banjun Station coffee, and you, as you can read here on English, and the small drawing, it's a lithograph, and we fix our self-price. We are not waiting the price from, from the north, from the western, because they fix the price of the coffee 
for the 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 third continent or the third world and we was against of that and that was we create our self plantation to make grow our coffee to dry and to torify and to, to, to package and to fix the price. One box of coffee is 20 euro. It is like an art edition. It is an artwork. That was how to, to be against and to fix ourselves, our price. Here is the second mobile cafeteria in the Roskill Festival in Denmark. And ban uh, the mobile cafeteria of Banjul Station can be, can be during the FIAC, during our Basel, or during Miami Basel, or uh, during 154, we, may, we was there, and we show Banjul Station coffee mobile cafeteria. And it is a cafeteria where we can have a play, uh, some player, we can have a games, we can have a television because in, cafe, in, in Africa cafeteria you have uh, television, live, live footballs in TV, you have discussion, you have uh, some games and at the same time the people test coffee. Here was during Ros Roskill festival in Denmark and here was in the art fair Uh, 154 and the young people can take part of that thank you Nana Oforiata Yain, welcome. And uh, you are an artist at heart, but you're an activist in spirit. So we are listening with care to what you say. Welcome. Hi, I am. Um, it's a um, it's a funny setting for me to be in. I I don't know how many of you were here last night, but a little bit like the statue we we're looking at, I feel a little bit out of place in this setting. I am. Um, I'm a writer and an art historian, and I have a contemporary art space in Ghana. And most of the forums that I um, participate in are with like-minded spirits and souls who are trying to agitate against the status quo, who are trying to build new systems and new models. So being in an establishment or amongst, I mean, it's a great um, privilege to be in this forum and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and it's, it's interesting to also step out of one's comfort zone. Um, listening to kind of the leaders of, of establishments and of ways of um, navigating culture in a way that we're trying to deconstruct is quite an uncomfortable space to be in, but hopefully a productive one. Um, I'm the, when I got first the email about this topic, the role of the Encyclopedic Museum in Complex Political Times, I was very fascinated because I think it's a very um, prescient subject and it goes into all areas. I think that um, um, I worked in the British Museum about 10 years ago or so and at the time I was very very concerned with bringing our narrative and when I say our I mean Ghanaian, Akan, um, into the British Museum, into um, English institutions. I very much wanted to upturn the narrative. Um, nowadays I don't really care so much because I think that, for me, the future of narrative building, the future of museums is no longer in Europe. Um, in a way, a little bit, these conversations and this narrative is a little bit irrelevant to what 
we're doing in terms of creating new systems, for me, the future of these new ways of telling narratives is on the continent, is in the global south, is in Asia. Um, and a little bit what I see when I come into these encyclopedic museums is their own death observing themselves in a way. And out of these deaths, maybe something interesting as well will emerge. But um, I am, um, at the same time as I say this, the Encyclopedic Museum has had a really important, played a really important role in my own becoming. The British Museum, when I um, lived in London, um, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, was a really important part, especially the reading room, the idea of a library within a museum, so you don't just go to see, but you also go and learn, was very important. Um, I, I lived in Russia for a year, the Hermitage, I had a free student pass when I was there. The Hermitage is somewhere I went every day, and actually it was where I decided to become an art historian. Um, but, one thing that I, I did a master's in African art history and one thing that I was very disturbed by was that the terms and the concepts that we were using were European ones, Herman, uh, hermeneutics, phenomenology, semiotics. I really wanted to understand the things that we were looking at and trying to understand on their own terms. I, um, so then I, 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 from being in the West, I, I looked back homewards. Um, and discovered all this kind of wealth of knowledge that had been sitting there all the time, but that I didn't know about because the starting point is always the West. One thing I found out was, so I started to do a research degree, a PhD, looking at kind of um, what, might, what might these philosophies of aesthetics, etc., be like. I discovered that my great-grandfather, um, Yabuachi Danko was what is called a divine drummer, a custodian of history, and that this kind of passing on of history and of contextualizing was something that was in my family for a long time and that I didn't have to look very far to find it. So um, I started actually turning the PH or the research inwards, um, which was funny because I more and more saw that within the museum context, we were objects rather than subjects. And my, my journey, in a way, has been to turn that upside down and take control of our own narratives. Um, I then kind of apprenticed with my uncle, who was also an Odumon Kumatruma, which is a divine drummer. A divine drummer or custodian of history in my kingdom is normally, is actually always a man. Um, so it was very unusual for me to take on this role, but um, less and less younger people are interested in taking on this role of the historian. So I think my uncle was just so happy that one of our family members was interested in taking this on. Um, just a word about the, um, this form of passing down history, which is called Ayan, which is a form of musical language um, where the tonal pattern mimics that of um, speech language. They're elusive, they're elliptical, they're multi-textured and multi-layered. Um, their form is flexible. Um, so that you can vary it according to the performance, even though they draw on a common repertoire. Um, its interpretation or translation is often more marked by what's unsaid than by what's said. Um, and it's one of these forms of passing down history, which included ellipses or abstractions that led the colonizers who came in to surmise that there was no history worth telling. Um, so, I, once I kind of started getting into this um, other way of narrativizing, other way of historicizing, um, I actually, I'm a writer first and foremost, and I was writing a novel which comes out next year, which also kind of crossed over into the idea of museology. And I started looking in, in um, English and European museums for fragments of my own reality in a way. Um, and found some of them in the British Museum, in the National Portrait Gallery, I've actually found pictures of my own grandfather, um, which kind of compounded this idea of how do we move from this space of object into subject. Um, I also realized that objects like this, which is the um, intumpam or the, the um, talking drum, these same objects that were housed in glass cases or in the vaults um, were actually in, this is in my home, 
um, in my, or my, my kind of family home, the same drum, which is brought out year after year, for, um, which is, you know, some of these drums are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Some of these garments, like this is in a museum. This is my cousin wearing a very similar um, garment, a batakari. Some of these are like centuries old, and yet there's a very different way of historicizing them. They're not put behind glass cases, they're animated. The custodians of them know exactly what each pouch, which element, which color, what everything was used for. Um, and this to me is, is a far more interesting journey or, or way of looking in than, than standing in a museum and looking at a glass case, personally. So it was, it was something that I, I, I again went deeper and deeper into. But the, the question, they were, the, the um, objects and textiles were brought out every year, particularly at festivals, at funerals, etc. And these festivals were, I guess, what you in German might call Gesamtkunstwerke, where, um, you know, there's design, music, poetry, history, politics, religion, um, processions, dance, reenactments of historical events, of migrations, of origin myths, um, you know, this kind of polyphony of, of art, of design, of history, of culture. Um, and they weren't just something that was a relic of the past, but this, this festival, for example, is a festival that some friends of mine started in 2011, and which all of the kind of artists and art organizations in Ghana take part in. The really interesting thing about this festival is that time has collapsed. So on the top, for example, you'll see some of the more traditional um, performances or processions. And on the bottom, you'll see these are three friends of mine who are actually commenting on the historical um, processions through their own contemporary possessions. So there's not only the kind of historical dynamic in actions of culture, but there's also contemporary ones which flatten time and include past, present and future in the same moment. Um, so these festivals are these kind of living histories, but at the same time, we can't, which have gone on for centuries and centuries in, in Ghana and other parts of Africa, but at the same time, we can't deny the presence of the museum in the same way that we can't deny, you know, whatever colonial um, impact has come in, you know. Um, like, for example, you know, when Ngugi Wa Thiongo, who I love as a writer, talks about the decolonization of the mind and of literature, Yes, I, I completely agree that we have to and need to write in our own languages, but at the same time, I think that there needs to be also an acknowledgement of this encounter. And so when it comes to the museum, for example, how do we incorporate or encompass this idea of this enclosed cultural space which you enter into and which is of value of itself and maybe bring in this kind of dynamism, this kind of fluidity of are historical forms of mediating, of exhibiting, of um, learning, of exchanging culture. Um, this was a question that I was asking myself again and again and again. How do, how do we bring the two forms together and in the same time make this kind of in, in, encounter inclusive, democratic, so as I was asking myself what kind of structure might um, encompass this, we have um, in Ghana, anyone who's been to Ghana or other parts of West Africa will have seen this kiosk, which is um, ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's a little wooden structure, it's very cheap to create. You have barber shops, hairdressers, um, gaming shops, little cinemas in these kiosks. So when I was asking myself about the structure, it became more and more, um, obvious to me that I start with the kiosk because nobody's intimidated by it. Whereas the National Museum, you know, like these structures here in the West, are these huge big structures where if you're, I don't know, a kid who hasn't been exposed to these things or even an adult, you might be intimidated by entry. So I, I, I for one of the Charlie Water festivals, oops, I created this kiosk museum. Um, which was, so you see the structure of the kiosk, and it was like, I, even I was astounded by the kind of popularity of it and by how many people came into it. Um, and what I did, so um, I've kind of 
started this idea of the moving or mobile museum that, which goes into different regions. So what I do when I go into each region is I collect objects, photographs, etc., from the area and then exhibit it, contextualize it, um, make films, collect objects, and then invite people from those communities into the museum. Um, these photographs were actually, um, you know, from, it was from the oldest photography studio in Osu, um, so they're from the 1920s onwards. Um, but the interesting thing was when people came in and looked at them, sometimes they recognized their forefathers. It was just the, the engagement with the objects and the photographs was exactly kind of what, I, even beyond what I'd hoped for. Um, this was the next year's mobile museum. Um, and then this is what the mobile museum has morphed into. I collaborated on this project with an architect. She's very, she's 23. Um, she's an um, architecture, was an architecture studio at Kenya's TR Art Academy. And what I asked her to create was um, a museum that you can fold up and in a way not put on your back, but at least on the back of a track so that you can travel with it. So this museum actually comes apart into panels and she made it transparent so that you can maybe, you know, put cloth from each region that we travel into. So this is, a, this is one that we're actually touring. Um, another thing that I was concerned about or, or, or that I asked myself is how do we create a platform which reaches out to as many people as possible. I was quite fascinated by the encyclopedia as a concept in itself, um, by the idea of, you know, the encyclopedia um, as this authoritative, you know, like definitive um, knowledge um, brick or, you know, colosseum made like as knowledge has been for the last whatever years by a white man, um, because they are the, um, you know, progenitors of knowledge. I was very interested in this idea of deconstructing this whole concept of the encyclopedia, um, kind of coming from it from my point of view, which obviously deconstructs where it came from in the first place, but also of, instead of it being this objective, authoritative, um, linear, um, knowledge concept of looking at it, first of all, very subjective, secondly, as ever-evolving and not authoritative, um, and thirdly, as kind of, uh, what's the word, like ungefähr, like not, no, not gefährlich ungefähr, like it's not approximate. So it's not, it's never, um, it's never pretending to be an objective work. It's never pretending to be exhaustive. It's never pretending to be authoritative. So the idea that I had was um, to create one encyclopedia for each country using the paradigm of country first of all, because for want of a better one, maybe throughout the process I'll come up with a better one. Um, and I started, I, um, I was included in the show um, at the new museum called The Ungovernables in 2012. And that's when I made the first sketch for a culture encyclopedia um, and started with Nigeria. Um, and then shortly after that, in Ghana, I, I um, approached different friends, different colleagues um, who were um, experts in their different fields to be editors of the process. Um, we did workshops at Dakar, and I got a grant for this from LACMA, um, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, and like a lot of people on the African continent, and like Bart um, Bartholomew, like, you know, we have to, I think, not just be creatives, but also the creators of the context of our creation. And so you find a lot of art, um, writers, artists, filmmakers on the continent also acting as contemporary um, build, creating contemporary art centers, working in museums, writing their own narratives, because I think we're so tired of having our narratives written on our behalf. Um, so we did the first workshop, and I wanted the encyclopedia to be a very living, dynamic thing, not just to be on the, online, not just to be in the pages of the book, but to be ever living and animated. And so this is the first shop, workshop that we did as part of the Biennial of African Art in Dakar in 2014. And then I got invited by the Cadiz Foundation to Paris. We did another workshop. Um, and then this is one that we did in Accra last year. Um, and the idea is to invite writers, philosophers, thinkers, um, cultural practitioners 
together, to think together about how we might create our new cultural realities. And now this is the beginnings of the Culture Encyclopedia site. It's at culturalencyclopedia.org. Um, and I mean, it's still so much in its early stages, but the idea is to create a kind of pan-African network, an online network, um, and also, so we started with Ghana, with a team in Ghana, um, going through the 10 regions, uploading the material. We have different layers of material. We have the ones that, the immaterial culture that we find while we travel. Oops. Um, sorry, my time's up. Um, we have, the, and we have also the material, like um, original material. We have um, material that we find through going into universities, and all of this goes onto the site. And then finally, um, to go back to the museum structure. So our government um, in March d announced that they're going to turn this castle, which was built by the Danes, into a museum. Um, and for the first time, actually, our government has actually come in and asked us, our arts practitioners, to come in and help them create a new museum um, with like some of the store, store stuff in the stores as well. And I'm helping with, with the artistic direction of this new museum. Um, and also actually talked when um, um, Hardwick Fisher was here to um, you know, the British Museum and seeing if there's some form of partnership that's possible, not like, um, not like Siraj was saying, where the British Museum become the expert, experts in this narrative, but more maybe in terms of an exchange of knowledge. And so in terms of the role of the Encyclopedic Museum, just to conclude, I think the future of it is more in this two-way stream rather than in the one-way stream that has been so prevalent ever since the inception of the museum where you know you come into us take what we have and then write it for us and then come back to teach us about our own objects i mean yeah so, that's it. Is this on? Could you tell us whether the Banjo project is a work of art? Uh, I think Banjo Station is a continuity. It's, um, how to say, a prolongement, a continuity of my artwork. Because in, in my art production, I'm really I am uh, an, an artist engaged, and I am, uh, I am an, art, an artist, uh, how to say, political artwork, and I think it's not just to be, to be critic. It, I think it is important to combine the idea of my production on the same way to, 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 to produce something uh, real. I don't want to just to be in, 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 in the critic part. I want to be like an actor. Actor, that, that was Banjo Station. It's a continuity of my art production. But I am against how the African dictator are doing in, uh, in Africa. I cannot continue day by day to be against them. 
I need to, 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 to go on and to create directly some project, some, some, some real project, and to sh that is another way to be, to be politics. That was Banjun Station for me, it's one part of my, my art. And in your thinking, yeah. is there another chapter? Is there something you want to do with Banju Station which you haven't done yet? I think I am, if I, if I good to understand, because I'm not good to understand what you, your question, but I think um, uh, I am on the way to use Banjun Station uh, as my artwork. I'm not finished. Uh, I'm going to continue to, to take part of one part of the development of Africa. That was Banju Station. I cannot stop with Banju Station. I, I need to continue this produce this way um, that I start. And, uh, and Africa, Africa needs her, her son that they have some knowledge to give back those knowledge for Africa to develop our continent. We need to, to ask ourselves, what I do for Africa? I am doctor, what I do for Africa? I am uh, a, a footballer, what I give back to Africa? We as African on all profession, we need to, to think what we give back to our continent. Um, I cannot stop this project. I'm going to continue. I think I have, a, again, many things to give back to Africa by agriculture project because it's more important to give the food to people before they make art. It's good to have a good food to eat, to have own on self, self, uh, self uh, autosuffisance alimentaire, self, self sufficient is very important. That is my preoccupation now. I just finished two, two months vacation in Africa, in Cameroon. That is the weather, the time for, for agriculture. <coughs> and I was all those two months in my farm. It is very really strange to, when I am in Paris, I am artist. When I'm in Banjun, I am farmer. <laughs> and I think it, the project is very long. I'm not sure that I give you the answer of course to my did. question. Of course you did. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if you could tell us why you wrote a novel. <laughs> what, did you, what was the form of the novel that allowed you to say something you couldn't otherwise say? As you from, from probably tell, I've got quite strong opinions. Um, I, um, I feel that I could be more truthful in the novel. I feel like um, the novel or the fiction format allows for truth in a way like I couldn't get to as an art historian. Um, I, can get, I could get more into the corners of, of everything and also, you know, the thing of collapsing time and going into the concrete, but also the, the wider, the more metaphysical, if that makes sense. When does it come out? Next year. Next year, everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to go. Uh, so I'm picking up on the dangerous word you used, Marion, which is empathy. And my question to you is, what do we need from each other? Generally, in life? I mean your institution, the big encyclopedic institution, 
the museum professional, the art historian in Ghana? What do we need from each other? I think, first of all, humility. Um, and then both kind of um, laying off one's assumptions and prejudices and presumptions. Um, like, almost like coming into a round naked. I mean, it's a weird me metaphor, but like laying off all your past constructs, coming into this kind of circle as human beings and as equals, first and foremost. I feel like a lot of the time when I come into encounter with the West, there's a, immediately this kind of like strange hierarchy or dynamic where, you know, it's either like, oh, we're helping you or, um, you know, come in. This idea of hospitality that I had, I found problematic. Um, you know, for example, one, one example is a foreigner in Ghana is called an expat. Um, someone who comes to work in Ghana is called an expat. For example, you know, I was born here in Germany because my parents came to work here, but nobody would ever call them or came to study and work here. Nobody ever would in this country would call them an expat. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, almost in every single discourse, there's a disparity in language. Um, there's a disparity in the way that we meet each other. And I think all of my work, for example, is constantly chipping away at that disparity, whether it's to do with culture, you know, all of these in a way have to do with culture, whether it's to do with gender, race, um, history, um, anything. And so I think letting go of all of those constructs, which obviously is a huge, you know, it takes a lot of work to start from zero. Thank you. Okay, so at the front and then George. Um, thank you very much for those two papers. Um, just very briefly to, to frame my comment. I have been researching uh, museologies uh, outside Europe or non-European and I use that just to gesture to the demarca demarcations taking place in Europe and not outside Europe. Uh, so I'm interested not in art or artifact or ethnography per se, but uh, study those realities within the realm of their concrete social relationships, and that includes different intellectual frameworks through which they are mobilized. And uh, so the last one and a half days, you guys have been really the subject of my ethnographic case because I have been an anthropologically studying how you guys engage. And I find it remarkable uh, as a point of departure, we're talking about encyclopedic museums, and that certainly entails a certain universal claim, right? But that very discussion we are having here would be totally different on the northwest coast of Canada, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in most African locations you're way more familiar with. So that is very important to take into account. That goes way deeper than empathy or tolerance. We're talking here about a different intellectual understanding of what an encyclopedic museum or a museum might entail. That's the very first important point. That links back to a question, and then I explain briefly why I come to that question. Does the word and the concept art actually exist in your respective mother tongues or indigenous languages? And I refer that back to the area I'm familiar with, with in Hawaii, there does not exist the word art or artifact. Yet Hawaiian material culture is almost exclusively interpreted through those two museological mechanisms in Europe and in North America. That to me does not make any intellectual sense. Hawaii itself responds to that, for example, at the University of Hawaii, the course is not called contemporary art, it's called Native Hawaiian Creative Expression. And I wonder why we have never invented a museum of creativity. That would, to me, go a, a step towards encyclopedic. And then, that links what, and that's why I'm sitting to my ally, uh, that links really to what is really needed, and that's epistemic and ontological work. And as an example, yesterday, uh, when we had the talk with objects, 
it really exemplified what we really have to do because that entire exercise, in my view, really failed. First of all, it took the distinction between subject and object as a self-granted, self-evident point of departure. Whereas you guys know, and I know from across the Pacific, that what we called object in that context would most definitely be a materialized ancestral figure or whatever it might be. Then we didn't allow the object to speak back at all. And you guys did that by first to first speaker, really embedded something like what we might call an object in concrete social processes of creative engagement to face whatever humans face. And the second speaker, by calling us to embed what we might call object in the philosophical frameworks through which they actually originated. It's just not enough that we go to Hawaii and come back and interpret Hawaii to frameworks which were developed in Frankfurt or might be called social uh, or French sociology. So again, it's the epistemic and the ontological work which still doesn't grasp the material realities produced by people through their own philosophical frameworks. So in that links back to me and inside the Clyde the Museum can on, only have this universal claim if it allows different philosophies, different practices, different um, museologies to be enacted and to be revealed be beyond reducing it to art and artifact, which seem, still seems to be the case in this conference. No one so far has questions our own intellectual frameworks through which we still mobilize and interpret the rest of the world. So to link back to your question, to the initial question, does the world and concept art exist in your in indigenous languages? No, if somebody can exp explain me on French. Yeah, we, we. Yeah, je comprends. Si la question de l'art existe dans notre. Oui, oui, oui. oui. Yeah. Um... L'art, l'art, c'est. Oui, oui, mais tu peux traduire aussi. L'art, c'est un, c'est un concept occidental qu'on utilise parce que on a des langues importées, le français, l'anglais. Et... Art is a, an occidental concept and uh, it has been imported. So it doesn't exist. Et dans notre culture, euh, ça, ça a un autre nom qui est dans la vie au quotidien. C'est un autre nom qui est la façon de vivre au quotidien, qui est déjà pour nous une façon de faire de l'art. La façon de vivre chez nous au quotidien est déjà une manifestation de l'art. In, in his home, it has another name. It's the everyday life, which is art in itself. Au marché, je, au marché, je vois des gens qui font des actions qui sont pour moi déjà une performance dans la rue. Mais dans l'art, ça s'appelle performance. <laughs> yes, and at, at the marketplace, he says that's a work of art, it's a performance, you know. In, in, in the West, you would call that a performance, but it's what's happening just at the marketplace. L'art est dans la rue. Yeah, art is on the street. Dans la vie quotidienne. And in, yes, in everyday life. Et ici, on appelle ça l'art. And here you call it, yes, and here you call that art, and it's an occidental word. Importation par la langue. Yeah, an importation, a linguistic importation. Um, yes, we have words for culture, we have words um, that describe things aesthetically. I mean, I think what you were saying is probably much more your problem than mine. Um, I think that it... Um, <laughs> Um, I don't think that, I mean, you know, when you grow up in Ghana, there's words for all kinds of things, for different forms of beauty, for, I mean, if you 
do, you know, want to do your work and come into Ghana, for example, and find these out, that's the research process. But in, within the communities themselves, yes, there are words for cultures, there are words for aesthetics. Um, obviously, it's relative because from culture to culture, things differ. But um, I don't know, like this, this is in a way what I was saying in my talk that I just don't care so much anymore what the West thinks of us because we are, um, you know, we've been engaged in our own projects of describing and mediating things for hundreds and thousands of years. It's nothing new. Thank you very much. Uh, Togo and Nana, first of all, let me just say that you are really transformers. And uh, I don't think that you are just transformers in the African continent. You are transformers in the world. And I think that is what you should be talking about. You, you, your work is not only confined to the continent, because it's a great example uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, pardon? I said Nana and Togo. Yes. Uh, in 1996, Omar Konare, the former president of Mali and also the president of ICOM, uh, made a very prophetic statement. He said that uh, in Africa we need to break the walls of the museum and rethink the whole concept of museum because the mistake that we had made was to inherit uh, the concept of the museum the way it had been given to us and yet it was a representation of inequality. And so we needed to deconstruct the museum and basically, symbolically, destroy the walls of the museum and rebuild it. And for me, what you are doing is exactly that. You have moved the museum away from the traditional uh, thinking, which is cast in stone in Europe. And um, in the 1990s, uh, the, a number of African countries had program with, uh, with Sweden called uh, Swedish African Museum Program, SAMP. And uh, at first, the Swedes thought that they were giving us help uh, to teach Africans how museums can operate. We ended up teaching the Swedes and transformed them completely. Even the directors of museums and people in the museum who never used to open up their mouths in conference, they started talking. And now, if you go, the Swedes talk a lot. That was a transformation from Africa that you can actually be in a platform and engage in what you are, you know, doing. And so, for me, you have moved museum from a sterilized, static, cast in stone institution that privileges itself on privileged material to actually actualizing it on the ground and moving the boundaries to apply to the people wherever they are in all the ways. The concept of a kiosk is very prevalent in the African continent, from selling little goods like sugar to soap to little things, and you've taken that and brought it into the public domain where it can be moved around. For me, that is encyclopedic. The idea of moving the narrative from the building and the walls it, into the farms and creating facilities that people can actually sit in residency in a farm and look at bananas and coffee <laughs> and move it to Europe and put your own you know, terminologies and your own conditions. What makes you less expert? You are the expert. Those who are drinking that coffee are the consumers and you are the expert in the production. So for me, I think that my point is very simple. Europe must open up its eyes and stop thinking that they have it all. They have to start learning from other parts of the world, from Asia, from South America, from Africa. They need to, otherwise you will continue doing the same thing you've done for hundreds of years. Thank you. Did you want to say something? 
Ah, uh, just totally. And Nicholas Banner, uh, again, as former position as a museum historian. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, to all of this here. I'd like to have these debates about the Berlin Humboldt Forum five years ago. One, just only one debate on the quality of the last one and a half days. Uh, I would be very happy to have it. Uh, this is just a short comment. I just wanted to say that since hours. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I'd just like to um, rationalize or relativize a bit. Um, there existed and there exists still in Europe the debate on art and where the, the, what art is. And we have it about in museums since 250 years. It's not a very new debate and we have it very intensively and days and days. And there had been museums which are for creativity. They are called arts and crafts museums. And for instance, the Victorian Albert Museum, which is definitely the most fascinating museum on this in European museums history. And so interestingly, in the 19th and up to the 1970s, if you want to see in London non-European cultures, you had to go to the Arts and Crafts Museum. And maybe we could think about just shortly, from the position of the 1960s, it was a rise up in statues of museums to bring these objects in the, Victor in the British museums and close the department, for instance, for so-called Africa, whatever that is, so-called Asia, whatever that is, so-called India, in the Victorian Albert Museum, and open them again in the 1990s, 2010s. So, I mean, even museums are not that static, and sorry to say to you, Frank, I don't know your second name, but um, the debate is not very new, what is art, and that is, it's not totally in Western concept. I mean, China and Japan, they have the term art in their language, and they have ex nearby exactly the same definition like in Europe developed since the 15th century. But even in Europe, it's a very modern concept. Publicly used, the word art is since about 80, maybe 150 years. It's a very new thing. In public life, we use it very short, Tristani. So maybe we should bring a bit more history in the whole debate. I know, I know Monica wanted to say something and then Roxley. Does anybody else have their hand up? Anybody else? Yeah, first of all, thank you for this wonderful panel. Actually, what I wanted to say is partly been said because it's on this question, no, it's okay, of art and the need to historicize. What bothered me, and I thought both of you gave very wonderful answers, uh, but, but still I want to problematize this question of the kind of questions we ask. And what bothered me was a kind of unsaid Eurocentrism in the question itself. Is there a concept of art in this, in this? So because then, you know, there, there's implicit is a kind of a narrative of deficit. You know, so if you say, you know, we have our own words, but the, the narrative is they don't have art the way we have it. And so I liked the way you answered the question, but still, when we, if you want to historicize it, it also means that, you know, concepts are not static, they grow, they change. And I was, you know, so moved by your presentation, Bartolemy. And for me, that is really just a living example of how, you know, you, know, you interpret your own activity and it kind of you know it leads to and you, you you yourself you know think of it as art but you also think of it as a, a prolongement so it's a kind of, you know so which means that you have to we have to really pluralize our concepts and even we speak different languages and if we use in a European language the term art somewhere there has to be an awareness that this you know that th th this is a concept which needs to be you know, pluralize in very different ways, uh, even across the languages that we all don't know. That was just a question. But I have a uh, question to you, Nana. Um, you said, you know, you don't care about uh, what's going on in the West and the narratives because legitimately, you know, you create your own not narrative. Not as much as I used to, not yeah. anymore. No. Yeah, but no, but I want to ask you is, uh, where would you feel the need to also develop affinities with, with and with whom, um, you know, we, we're living in this very connected world and um, the kind of affinities that you think are important to you um, for, for the work 
which which you are doing which uh, you know which also needs to get you know constituted enriched by relationships outside and and how the kind of work you are doing there can also uh, you know reach out to uh, to maybe to, to to regions who are you know who are still ignorant about it yeah. i mean i think to say that I don't care, I mean, it seems very flippant. But I mean, of course, I care about connections. And, but again, from this point of view of equality, I don't want to be patronized to. I don't want to be told again and again that, you know, we, we're catching up with, with someone, which is the discourse around Africa still, prevailingly. Um, you know, like with this last... Um, the castle, the Osu castle, which is being turned into a museum. You know, for example, the, our government wanted to turn it into a presidential museum, and then they got me in to help with the artistic direction, and I said, doing a presidential museum is so boring, and it's so short term. I mean, we've, had, we've only been a country for 60 years. Um, you know, if you wanted to do something about leadership, you know, look back and see how leadership has developed through the centuries. Um, and then, you know, I did an exhibition on that for them, and then, you know, they were talking about doing partnerships. So, you know, I, you know, I have this kind of, not love-hate, hate is too strong a word, but like, you know, I love the British Museum, for example. I love the kind of reverence of it, but at the same time, I find it deeply problematic. Um, and so, you know, having kind of partnerships, you know, from a museum in Ghana with something like the British Museum, in a dialogue and in a discourse, kind of dealing with the kind of great benefits of it, but then also at the same time having very honest dialogue and discourse about its problematics, I think is something that brings all of us forward. And having that discourse is equal. It's not like, you know, like Siraj was saying in terms of partnerships before, have been where they come in and they're like, we're gonna train you to do your job properly. And I just don't think, of course, there's always gonna be a, an exchange of expertise. I don't say, you know, oh, we're not gonna learn anything. Of course, there's things that other people know much more than, than I or other people do. But it, I feel like this thing of exchange, this thing of equality, of parity is something and that's very kind of existent in the contemporary art world because in a way we start from the now. But I think as soon as it becomes institutional, as soon as like, you know, the museum is an imperial construct and the basis of imperialism was, you know, like this, like it was, you know. Um, so I don't think it's, it's a defunct thing, but I do think it needs to be reanimated. Oh, thank you. Uh, very simple. You both give me hope for my communities back home. Where can I learn more and what projects can you recommend for myself to learn and for others here to break their perceptions and narratives? I'm going to end with that. All right, so everyone's going to be frustrated. You want to ask a question. You want... We're going to end with that because that is an appropriate way. I um, am going to leave just at lunchtime, so I just want to say it was a great privilege and honor for me to play this role. I've got lots of stuff going on in my head. You've all given me gifts, uh, so thank you for that. I'm not going to do any summary because I think a summary is a closing of something. And I think we should just assume this is the opening of something. So thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>
And, and I wonder what it makes with your work in the United States. In the next years, you will be curious. I think nobody comes out of it um, without a certain changement in his work. So we can discuss it in our next meeting or next conference. So thank you.